Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined on the Axon Bulletin by Kevin Graham and Russell Boyce. Welcome back to the show, guys. How was your weekend? Awesome, mate. Awesome. Hectic. Just moving house and all that and sadly didn't watch as much of the live coverage as I like um, of the football, but I caught up yesterday. Thanks to everyone on Twitter as well for all the amazing match analysis that I got as well, Paul. I noticed that. I did notice that you weren't able to keep a keen eye um, on the action as it happened. Kevin, let's talk about the, the weekend's game first and foremost. We were looking pretty good for spells and then we kind of ran out of steam. But that day, it kind of summed up our season. We had a good 60, 65 minutes. But then as soon as uh, Motherwell scored with a flicky deflection, we, we hit panic stations for about 10, 15 minutes. Then we kind of got ourselves back into the game and it looks like we were going to see the game out. But obviously, um, Motherwell, especially in the last, the, maybe the last injury time, we had a bit of a flap uh, in defence and we were, maybe lucky, we were maybe lucky to see the game out. Motherwell were quite an interesting side. Eh? There was something that um, Jim and that says last week. Uh, basically about managers being available and managers, if we don't act quickly enough, we might not get the managers that we want. Mm. You, you look at Motherwell, Motherwell have went for, a, Motherwell have went for an interesting manager and in, uh, in the guy Alexander, not one that's on the usual list. Mm -hmm. And I often think there's an obvious list, then there's an interesting list. And Motherwell always pick managers for the interesting list. So it, it'll be interesting to see what they do. And I think that interesting list never never, never uh, disappears. People on the obvious list uh, get jobs, but the interesting list is always more, there's always more depth and quality, no, maybe no quality, but depth and narrative in that list. So Motherwell done okay. Um, I think they would have been quite, I think they would have been quite disappointed that they didn't get a point, but whether they deserved a point after the way that we played in the first hour uh, is an argument. But once again, we take off the legs, we take off Turnbull, we take off Taylor, we take off Ayeti, and we lose fitness after 65 minutes, which has been a problem all season. Yeah, it is. And the unfortunate thing about that, though, Kevin, was you're watching that game and... I don't know about you, I was pretty impressed. There was some e some elements of it, obviously, if you want to really be critical, but I was fairly impressed. I was liking the way, uh, I have liked the way that John Joe Kenny has uh, settled into the side, gives us a bit of balance. We keep saying that because, you know, it was a bit off balance when Frimpong was playing that position, especially when it comes to being a fullback. But um, he also gives us the out ball. You could see that time and time again. I don't know how effective uh, his crossing has been so far, but it, it certainly is stretching the back lines um, of Kilmarnock and Motherwell over the last couple of games. But uh, you're, you're watching that and you're getting a wee bit of enthusiasm about you know the new introduction of, of him, the performance of Turnbull, um, the supposed uh, return to form, uh, somewhat of Edwards. And then it's the disappointment of the last half hour. Uh, Russell, when you were looking back on the action, was that the feeling you got as well? It just seems like there's a real mental fragility about the side right now. And when something goes against us, the heads go down. I mean, I think we've seen it numerous times this season where even when we've had two goal cushions like, like, like the case was at the weekend, you were concerned that it was going to be blown by, uh, by the end of the match. And it worries me that They've, they've got so much doubt because, I mean, it's easy to cast your, your mind back to nine successful years like Neil Lennon's, you know, un, you're repenting and reminding us all when, whenever his job comes un, under scrutiny. But the players seem to have completely forgotten that um, during matches when, when, when they get remotely under, put under the cosh. I find that really concerning. I and mean, You have to hope that that's something that's very much temporary um, because I think there was, a, there was a comment made yesterday saying, you know, on Twitter saying sort of um, along the lines of, you know, what's what's the big deal, though, between now and the end of the season? Perhaps, you know, we don't need to worry too much, you know, because obviously we know that we will probably finish second. Um, I don't. I think that every day that goes by where we, we're still showing those sort of weaknesses and fragility, I think that's quite a concern that, you know, because because that can s steep into the club and, and the, the side's whole found, you know, everything about the side, that can become sort of a part of them going forward. And it's hard to shake off once it does creep in, you know, so... I would like to see us be, I don't know when we, 
maybe it was the substitutes. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, obviously we'll get to that. I'm sure, judging by the the show's title today. But I think um, I think I think it is concerning that they just seem the heads go down too easily. Um, I, th- I think looking back on the game, I don't think we were as hanging on as what the, when you were watching it in real time actually made out. Uh, we actually got control of the game again, and it was only it was only when we start when when we gave away that cheap free kick at the end when you knew it was going to be panic stations at set and for me. And if Motherwell would have scored, that was a great clearance by Laxall. If Motherwell would have scored for there, I think it would have been extremely harsh on the team. Truthfully. Kevin, see when you're looking at the the year, as in the games were played in 2021, going back to a point Russell actually raised, uh, what is there to play for? Well, I think about the turn of the year, even after the defeat uh, at Ibrox, I was looking at Celtic season and we know we all know what's happened before then. But I was looking at it and thinking, well, we've shown that, um, you know, going toe-to-toe with the runaway league leaders, Celtic, um, are definitely a match for them. I mean, we looked really good incidentally, for about an hour of that game. So then Dubai happens. Then then the whole Dubai saga um, started. And the, the form in January, actually, when you're looking at, for example, Rangers dropping points, and we talk about it quite a bit, Kevin, on the WhatsApp group. You know, every game, my prediction is nothing each. Um, to you know, in terms of the Rangers fixture, every single game, nothing each, because there are going to be days like that, and you know that as a league winner over nine seasons, we've seen plenty of displays home and away where you're you're getting a really um, poor result against a club, maybe the bottom reaches of the league. So that's going to happen, and it's going to happen again between now and the end of the season, and that's my biggest frustration about Dun- uh, Dubai, uh, because had we kept our own house in order. And that includes the game at the weekend because when you're two nothing up, that should be getting uh, turned into a three or four nothing, because then yep. you're cl- clawing back goals. But we're not keeping our own backyard in, in order. That's the problem that I've got with games like the Motherwell game. Yeah, we won, we clawed back two points. Uh, Neil Lennon has mentioned a professional pride, and quite frankly, I don't want to lose the league by twenty points, fifteen points, or at all. But you want to try and get any sing- single figures. Uh, January completely obliterated that when you look at the run of results we had in January and we know the reason why we had the depleted squad etc but losing six points to Livingston and Hibs you know when you're looking at a game at the weekend there where we've, we've actually gained a couple of points back on the league leaders that's what frustrates me everything everything else that went before you kind of thought at the turn of the year we could actually you know focus on the rest of the season and the comeback may have been on and it's going to be frustrating at the end of the year if we do cut that down to single figures because then you'll start to look at getting beat from St Mirren. You'll start to look at the two draws against Livy, the draw at home against Hibs when we were playing a shadow side. And that's when it really brings it home to you because results like you know one each against the bottom of the, the, the league team will happen to Rangers between now and the end of the season. How frustrating is that for you, Russell? Uh, you've just stole my thunder. That was my, my whole point for today was going to be how I think that... Uh, January might be the month that we look back on as the, the 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 points difference at the end of the season could potentially be the points that we lose in January. And yet that was the one time where we all knew just before January, make a change. If you're going to make the change, be bold and make it now. And for it to become like it was apathy, you know, by the third bad result of January, you look back now and it's like you say, obviously it was highlighted by the, the Hamilton's uh, score in the last minute yesterday. Of course, naturally, that's going to happen. And like I've said on this pod before as well, and okay, I'm sure it is coincidence because the league's pretty much sewn up. We don't want to get carried away. But as soon as Celtic put two wins together in a row in front of them, they drop points. And like I, I remember saying it a couple of months ago, but they don't like when we go on winning runs. We win five or six in a row. They will. What will they do? Will they mirror that? I think very unlikely. I think they tend to drop points when we're, we've just not put them under any pressure this season. Um, worthy of a, of a title challenge, let alone a 10 in a row campaign. And that, I think you're so right though, in what you're saying, highlighting January, because that points gap come the end of the season. I know you're saying you don't want it to be 20, but be careful what you wish for, because I think if that ends up a point margin that mirrors the points we've conceded in January, it is going to be an extremely frustrating situation indeed. 
It will. I mean, how many um, league races, title races, Kevin, have we been involved in where it goes to the wire, it goes to the last day of the season and you rue a last minute goal that you've lost against someone like Dundee, for example, which was the case when we beat Dundee 6-2. If you think back to when we lost the, the league um, against Kilmarnock, if you remember that, uh, when obviously Gordon Marshall uh, got a lot of stick from Celtic fans for celebrating the what was it, a 5 nothing victory when we needed, we needed to beat them 6 nothing. Um, so I think th this is going to be the frustration when we look back to uh, a horrific January. But I'm also looking at the performance, Kevin, at the weekend. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find as many positives as, as I can for any incoming manager. And we'll talk about that again because there's been developments around the director of football uh, appointment. But you're looking at that, you're looking at Welsh as being a, a real bright spot in that Celtic side. And obviously, the, the lead name on the title of today's show, David Turnbull, but also Sorrow. And I know he's been out of the team for the last couple of games, but we can't forget just the impact he made as well, Kevin. So if you're trying to look for, for positives, is that the type of players, is that the crop of players that, you know, will play a big part in Celtic's future? They will be. I just, I just want to go back until obviously yourself and Russell are feeling a bit frustrated. I'm not feeling frustrated. You mentioned a game there in 2003 and there's moments in that game in two, that season in 2003 where you look back and you go, if that happened, if this happened, the goal we lost in the last minute against Dundee, we were 6-1 up and it, and it ended up 6-2. Was it Lee uh, Wilkie? Remind me, was it Lee Wilkie that scored for Dundee? I think it was... I I thought it was Barry Smith. Was it? Or was it Barry Smith at putting the ball? Uh, it might have been Barry Smith. But I'm more annoyed that season about the 2 each draw we got at Dens Park. Mm -hmm. When we were 2-1 up and we lost a late goal at Dens Park. I look back on that and go, that Alan, uh, Alan Thompson missing the penalty at Rugby Park. There's loads of wee moments you look back and you can have regret. This season we've got no regrets. Absolutely no regrets whatsoever. It doesn't matter what happens from now to the end of the season. We've never challenged one iota this season. And there's not going to be one game you look back on and go, that was a game, that was a missed chance. We should have played better that game because we've been ranked rotten for the whole season. So the season's been a write-off. I've got no regrets about this season whatsoever. I've got no frustration about this season. We've been terrible and we're getting what we deserve. And whatever we get for now to the end of the season we get, we're looking for the positives. We need to actually love on the positives and that's it. So it doesn't matter if Rangers lose for games for now to the end of the season. The fact is we've put no pressure on them and we're getting what we deserve. So I'm, I'm happy to write this season off. It's been a complete and utter nightmare this season. Um, and we need to look forward. I'm kind of no glad this season happens, but this season gives me a different, different perspective going forward. Let's see the colour of the money now. Let's see how the, what this board's made it. We've had Talk. success. We've had mm -hmm. success. We've had great success. No, we've got away with bad decisions for the last four or five years. We haven't got away with bad decisions. Let's see what they've got. Let's see what they've got in the trouser department. Let's see what they've made it. Let's see if, if their vision for Celtic Football Club is, is the same as mine. So let's bring it on. You talk about perspective, Kevin, maybe a change in perspective. There's a lot of fans, I think, and again, I would never ever call Celtic fans entitled. I think it's great to demand the absolute best every single season and for every game and for every competition we're part of. But there is a, a huge amount of unrest amongst the Celtic fans who um, are frustrated. They are frustrated with the way that decisions have been made and incorrectly made this season. And even up to the Motherwell game, Matt, I was frustrated. It, it doesn't matter to me that uh, it may be a nothing season as such. I still get frustrated for every single game Celtic play where I feel a 2-1 against Motherwell should have been a 3 or a 4-0 because we were so much in the ascendancy in that game. So that frustrates me. Celtic are frustrating me on a game-to-game -game basis, Kevin. And what I'm trying to do is I'm looking at the, the CEO... Uh, change and obviously uh, Dominic Mackay coming in and we will see the new approach and the fresh ideas that are coming in with him. There's talk over the, the last few days about the director of football. We've touched on it in here quite a few times and I think what you said Kevin is it needs to be top to bottom rather than uh, root to branch. It, it needs to be the other way around and we've started that with the CEO. There's now talk of the director of football and obviously after that you would expect the manager to be the next position that you would be looking at. So although 
I, I am looking forward to the future in so far as a fresh approach, the new Celtic almost, I, I will always be frustrated that this season when I'm looking at that weekend's results and I'm not too impressed with what I'm seeing by Celtic first and foremost, but I'm not too impressed with what I'm seeing elsewhere either. The, the, the only reason, the only way that we'll ever get a decent narrative about this season, a decent handle on what this season actually was, is when it's a speck of dust in history. And that was that. That will be the only time it makes sense. When we were when we were living in two thousand and ninety nine two thousand, it didn't make sense in that. But five years later, that season made sense to us. When what happened next? So that's where I, that, that, that's what I'm trying to say is the present doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense until the future, and that, that I think that's where we are just now. Aye, it's not been the greatest season that we wanted, but it could be one of the, it could be the best thing that ever happened to us. Who knows? You don't know. That only future will tell us that. Only if future it, will tell us that. But in, you know, in that sense then, we're talking about a strategy, you know, a five-year plan, let's say, Russell. Um, I think winning the league again next season or the season after that, or even the season after that, I don't think would make this worthwhile. You know, I don't think that the level of change that we're going to go through between now and our next success would make what's happened this season worthwhile. The only thing that would make this season worthwhile is if the changes that are made are so substantial uh, that yeah. we, you know, we actually reaffirm ourselves on a European level if we re-engage with the fan base and, mm -hmm. you know, guys like ourselves feel more connected to the club that, that yeah. we've supported all our lives. So I, I totally agree, agree with what Kevin's saying, but what level would we need to get at before you actually look back on this season and see, obviously, the, the sense of it? I think we would need to get better than what we have been even in the last nine years. I don't know why it has to be give and take as well. Uh, like I've said before, I mean, the Celtics, I think, I think Celtic are really, really struggling at building on success, building from a position of strength. You know, this should have been the the catalyst for the win ten in a row. Uh, Peter Lowell goes out and in and, and the sunset, all delighted with his cell. The new the new C com comes in with a new management team, perhaps, because I'm sure Lennon would have left as well, to be honest with you. Um, and then that is with an air of positivity straight away. Not an air of having to silence doubters, not in an air of uncertainty, not in a as he had long enough to make his decisions. It could have been on a wave of complete positivity on the biggest domestic achievement the club could ever have made, which would have been 10 in a row. It's referred to as the Holy Grail. There's a reason for that. I remember growing up in the 90s and it was such a big deal to my dad us stopping the 10. Do you know what I mean? It was so important. So for us to win nine twice and then it to be this season's the one that we look back on in five years as, you know, was it important? Was it not? I find that a really, I find it frustrating that they would choose this season of all seasons to be that one. I think and like I say, I think they, they both could go hand in hand. I really do believe that if we'd won the 10 this season and all these future successes in Europe, like you speak of, and trying to re-establish yourself there, become easier, not not harder, if you do keep on building on the success. And to be quite honest with you, I mean, we've completely let the competition creep back in. You know, it's been it's Celtic have beaten Celtic as well, as, as much as as much as much you've got to respect what, what, what's happening on the other side of the city. I think... Um, Celtic have been huge catalysts in their own downfall as well. Oh, without think, a doubt. I think what you say is, Russell, Celtic never planned on this season being an utter washout the way it has been. They never planned on that. They, they went in it with the best intentions. And those best intentions were were put into place 18 months ago when they appointed Neil Lennon. Yeah, built on complacency. Me, for me, that's when it was gambled. Now, you could say we could have we could have had success this season. We could have won the 10 this season. Then the changes needed might have not happened. They might have just went, we'll get away with it again. We'll get away with it again. So mm. it's maybe a good thing getting slapped in the face. This so of season, all the seasons, of all the seasons that had to be this one, you know. Do you think, <laughs> do you think Kevin, that um, had we had that level of success, that Peter Lowell would still have retired at the end of this season? Oh, I, I really do. I, I, I do think Jim Orr says on Friday, hi, Jim, uh, says on Friday that um, he, he reckoned that the Peter Law re retiring was a reactive. I don't think it's reactive. This club doesn't seem to do, even though it looks like we do reactive, I think we do think, I, I think sometimes we plan things 
too much, look at things too much and take our time too much. I don't think we do anything utter reactive, which goes against what I've probably said in the last four or five months. The reason that I've got around to that is because we managed to appoint a new CEO through an interview process through an interview process and nobody knew about the interviews. It, what that shows me is we, we've all got guys who like to say that are in the know. I get texts, Paul gets texts, we get WhatsApp messages and all that. But the truth is now, anybody that was a decent source in the last four or five years has they got a clue what's happening in Dermot, in, in Dermot Desmond's circle of trust. For us to be able to appoint a a high-profile CEO and nobody know about it shows there's things happening behind the scenes that we haven't got a clue what's mm -hmm. actually going on. The club are just not telling us because that's not the way that they do business. I've said for the last two or three weeks now, and I fully believe it, that whoever's going to be the Celtic manager next year already knows it and is already sitting making plans for next season. You would hope so, because obviously without that... Um period of assessment, Russell, it was going to be very difficult to get the team prepared for the, the yep. European qualifiers. So you would hope that was the case. That being the case, then, it would probably point towards someone, I would guess, who is unemployed, un unless they have uh, gone through that process of seeking permission to speak to someone who's already employed at a club uh, and compensation will form part of that package. But I don't think the, you know, the way that Celtic do their business um, would result in us going for somebody who's employed. I don't think we'd be looking for uh, a big payment of compensation, particularly under the circumstances with COVID and uh, the financial restrictions that that's creating. So if you're right, Kevin, and I'm, to be honest with you, when you're looking at the way that uh, this is, you know, developing CEO already in place uh, come the summer. There's talk around, and let's talk about it now, a director of football. And then obviously, with all of that in mind, even if the name that's being touted around at the moment isn't the correct name, because the one that I've been looking at is Fergal Harkin, who is coming in from Manchester City. I think everybody's read. You're smiling because you're thinking of Fergal Sharkey, I think. Um, I get that heart, it's hard to find it. The famous, the famous <laughs> quaff uh, of Fergal Sharkey. Um, but, I mean, if that is the case, then you would expect the whole process to be a three-pronged affair where it's all joined up. So the manager, as Kevin suggested, is already kind of lined up. It's just that we don't know about it. Do you reckon that is the, the way forward for Celtic, Russell? I think it'd be amazing if it was. I mean, I suppose in fairness, I mean, the CEO, like, it was a good point there because when that was announced, the new CEO, um, it was under the radar completely. No one had a clue. If that is the same case as with the management, that'd be quite interesting because I'm not still convinced there's a view need to have a delay in that one. I don't see any benefit to them just watching from afar. Um, I think the longer that the, the players are in these methods and playing with, you know, little of tactics that they've not enjoyed playing with under this season, a motivator they're not responding to, I only feel it regresses players' development and valuations further and further with every day that passes. So if there is a management team lined up, and then we go to your point, and they are they are unemployed, what, what are we waiting for? Um, I, don't, I don't see any issue in getting them in now. But they, they might not be unemployed, but they might no. not have a job in the summer. I was just following the two the two points you were both making, though. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously Paul said he thought it would be an unemployed boss if that, if that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, if it is an unemployed manager, it'd be quite interesting because obviously I hope no one moans about them being a rat when they leave us because that would be uh, <laughs> that'd be very Brendan. It's not Brendan Rogers, is it? <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> <laughs> there could be there could be an international coaching team who will be available after the Euros. What the, the, Martinez like and Maloney? It could like well that. be. You, you, you don't know. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't actually know. I mean, I think that's I think that's how we're so frustrated as Celtic fans. I mean, I'm I'm not frustrated what happens on the on the on the on the field because I say we haven't competed this year whatsoever. I'm frustrated that the way that they've handled the season tickets. I'm frustrated that they went to Dubai. For me, that's the biggest disasters of the two season of this season. Not mm -hmm. what's happened on the pitch is the way that they've treated the fans off the pitch. Bad seasons happen. Bad season in, in this situation will actually happen. We'll probably never face a situation as bad as this ever again. 
well, maybe at the start of next season, who knows? But the way that they've treated the supporters this season has to be has to be rectified. Uh, right. And for me, I can handle bad seasons. Look, I'm a football fan. You lose games of football. That's what happens. It's not all about winning all the time. It's how you actually treat your fan base and how you move forward and how you react to your mistakes. And uh, that's what I'm really interested in this season, uh, next See, but, season, going forward, or whatever season it is. See, with that in mind, Kevin, you're talking about, um, obviously, the fans and the way that uh, some people, quite a lot of fans, feel this disconnect between ourselves and the club. Uh, we're looking at a season ticket holder. Now, that that is, am I right in saying that's 57? Because I've been quoting it as 54,000. Is it as much as 57,000 season ticket holders at Celtic have? Is it as high as that? I, th um, I think it went up to 56 this, this year. Uh, because they had reconfigured the away end yeah. or something like that, something weird. So we were able to sell some more because uh -huh. we weren't actually at the game uh, even as well. When that comes round again, this is a massive consideration that I don't know what's going on behind the scenes in relation to trying to build bridges with, between the club uh, and the fan base. But all of this is happening again when we will be asked to renew season tickets. And I think that with that in mind, Russell, obviously, if, if Neil Lennon was to be replaced before the season's out, then, you know, again, there's going to be a payoff. And I think it is a purely financial decision at this moment in time. So last week, um, it was actually during one of our bulletins, the Green Brigade uh, unfurled yet another banner, this time up at Lennox Town, and they made a statement on their social media channels. Um, are these efforts, as, as admirable as they are, Russell, are these e efforts a bit futile uh, under the circumstances? Do you think the club are simply going to ignore um, protests such as that? Uh, yeah, there's not going to be a change now between now and the end of the season. I don't, unless, I mean, real, real disasters happen, which I can't foresee. I mean, like I said a couple of weeks ago, I think second is, without being too complacent, a formality. Um, I'm, not, I'm saying that with respect to other sides, but I do think we will pick up enough points between now, now and the end of the campaign, and that will allow Lennon to stay in the role. Do I personally see the benefit in that? No, I don't. Like I've already touched on, but... Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it is futile uh, making, you know, the, the banners. By all means, it's good to express your it's good to express your, your opinion. And I like that. I think it is important that regardless of whether we expect change or not, let the club know they didn't change, even though, you, you know, there was a, a percentage or a majority, in, in this case probably, that do want it and that, that that's falling on deaf ears. If there is a grand master plan like Mr. Positive today, Kev's talking about, then fantastic. I'll be delighted if that's the case. And the reason that Neil Lennon's staying until the end of the season is wait and see, you know, the rabbit that they pull out the hat. Amazing if that's the case. And, you know, the banners, they'll look futile, you know, they'll look ridiculous um, going forward. But I, I don't see any way that Celtic don't have Neil Lennon in charge for the final game of the season. I think he will be there. Uh, I think he'll get us the job done, but the job done being second place. And that shows just how far everything's fallen off a cliff this season. I uh, appreciate the fact that you're not as concerned about on the pitch, Kev, but I think they go hand in hand again. I don't think the fans feel like they're getting treated with as much disdain if the results are all happening on the pitch. Um, because there wouldn't need to be that level of communication, for example, that they've not given this season. Um, I think the two things sort of dovetail, to be honest with you. Didn't get me wrong. I didn't want. I didn't want to blow. I, I didn't want to blow this season. But uh, and I will admit the club's been mismanaged. I will admit that the, the team's poorly coached. That they, they look unfit. Uh, there's been games where we've been a tactical shambles. I'll admit that. I will really admit that. Mm -hmm. But on, on on the other on the other hand, why is Neil Lennon going to be there at the end of the season? And we've got to consider this, that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And I found Lennon's comments at the at the weekend really, really interesting about him visiting the players. And I'm going, well, if you're bringing in a, a new manager just now, if you're trying to bring in a new manager just now, he's got to try and build bonds with a, with a squad in a situation where it's actually quite clear that a lot of the squad are struggling with the, the lockdown situation. So maybe the board have, have had a look at it and says, look, the, the team are still backing this manager and there's been completely out of control circumstances. We know that the fans want a change, but making a change just now is going to be really detrimental to the players and they're not going to do it. 
I, I found it quite interesting that Neil Lennon used that used the phrase. What what did he say? That, that I'm going I'm going to verbatim this here. He says he was he had cleared his conscience. He had, he had clear. His conscience he, is clear. His he conscience is clear. So for me, that means that he's had the full and frank conversation with those in charge, and he knows what's coming. The verbatim. There you know. The there you go. That, that that'll be the name of you and Russell's new podcast on Axum. The, the verb. The verbatim. Um, the yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. The, the, storm in heaven. The verbatim. A storm in heaven. Yeah, the, the thing with that, Kevin. The thing, the thing with that, we touched on it when we were talking about uh, Albion Ayeti the other day, I think it was on Friday, and we were talking about how in football you see somebody playing badly, and if you're at the game you might tell them that, but uh, basically you can write them off and they're off form, and they're a bad sign and, and they're a flop. But one thing that um, over the piece that I've started to consider is obviously under the circumstances, everything that's happened behind the scenes. So you, you learn that Ayeti is uh, staying in a hotel. You look at the situation that Ilhamid's in, you know, there was reports coming out that he was going to return to Israel. Then his agent came out, called it fake news. Now it looks as though it's back on. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, the, these players who, you know, their families aren't always with them. They're in a country that they might have just arrived this year, i.e. Albiana Yeti. And they're struggling. They're actually struggling because they're not robots. You know, they're human beings. And, you know, in the case of Yeti, they might not speak brilliant English. But normally what would happen is they have that freedom to meet up with their teammates and have a coffee and do whatever footballers do. I'm not quite sure. They play computer games and all that carry on, don't they? Um, I don't know what they do in their spare time. But that camaraderie is gone. It's completely gone because of the circumstances. So then I start having quite a bit of sympathy for people like Albiana Yeti, who showed enough in the first half dozen games to indicate that there was a quality player there. So we're not seeing, for me, we're not seeing the real Albion Ayeti. And how many other players who have come in from the, the crop of seven who have actually brought to the club are suffering uh, the same as Ayeti? Because I find it interesting that some players come in, they look brilliant in the first half a dozen games, i.e. Diego Luxalt, and then they tail off. And then it's easy for me to sit here and go, I blame Lennon, the coach, for that. That's Lennon's fault because he's not motivating them. They're all flatlining to Lenny ball. But let's, let's look behind that and say, well, you know what? These guys are under really difficult circumstances away from the park. And then people might say it's the same for every footballer. But I think the overhaul that Celtic have had this season in terms of personnel coming in has been quite quite high. We brought in seven players. Every single one of them, I guess, was brought to play for the first team. There's no projects in that. The only um, question of a project might have been Turnbull, and he's turned out to be the best signing out of them all, and he's playing every single week, first name on the team sheet. So I think when I'm looking at it as well, Kevin, uh, some of these players, I think we won't get the real view of a Yeti and maybe some of the others until next season. So we won't get the benefit of a Yeti. I mean, Barkas as well. Look at the stick Barkas has come under since he came to Celtic. What's happening in the background? How is he able to integrate with his teammates away from training and the game? Probably not at all, you know, other than travelling to games and, and things like that. So I think my own view on that has softened quite a bit, probably because you are resigned to the fact that we're not going to win the league this season. So you, you're looking at the Barkas situation and we need to talk about the goalies because we're in a bad situation at the minute and any incoming manager is going to have to bring a new one in, I would guess. But when you're looking at the Barkas and Ayeti particularly, there are so many issues with this season, Kevin, that we could never have foreseen because we didn't know that we were going to be uh, in this global situation. Why have we not handled it well? And that's something that the club need to review. Why are other clubs handling it better than what we've done? Is it because there was there was a, a split in the dressing room anyway? Six players wanted to leave, so you've got these these new guys who come into a dressing room which is already split. The splits have has uh, made bigger with COVID because there's no social interaction. The players go to train and then go home, sit in, sit in their house. I mean, I noticed Lack Salt was on Twitch last night playing whatever they play on Twitch, was it Fortnite he was playing? Where, where his wee character had a Celtic top on. 
So he had Celtic fans joining in with him with that and talking away to him on that. That's a bit, that's a new bit of interaction on me. I mean, I, I don't play games. I didn't even know who the weekend was last night until I watched the Super Bowl half time, and I got a lot of abuse for that on Twitter as well. Do you know who the weekend is, Paul? Only because you mentioned it, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, I'm too been. busy. I'm too busy listening to Radiohead, mate. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm listening to Sleaford Mods, so folks saying I'm not up to date. I think Sleaford Mods are quite up to date. Well, I don't I'm, know. I, I'm, I, I'm stuck. I'm stuck in 1998. I'm listening to OK Computer. That's what I'm listening to. Uh, aye. So where was I there? I've completely lost my train of thought there. Twitch. <laughs> Twitch you were talking. You were talking about um, like salt and players away from training and away from games. Aye, so it is completely different. But then the the club of uh, uh, why is Ayeti still in a uh, still in a a hotel room? Why is he still staying in a hotel? The club have need to sort that out. The club should had uh, guys there sorting this out for the players, and it's been really difficult for them. But then again, that's another failing in the coaching staff. That's another failing in the uh, in the infrastructure of the club that they haven't been able to handle this as well as what other clubs have. And you could be right; we could have changed too much too soon. The, the big this, thing about the, this could have been the wrong year to actually bring in so many new players. Big thing yeah. about the hotel, Kevin. Just to to um, expand on that a wee bit. That for me is basically it's a, it's a normal uh, course of action for players coming to a new club until they are reunited with their family right mm -hmm. generally speaking and I've spoken to a few players who you know had gone down south for example to Leicester they followed Craig Levine down to Leicester and they, they, their whole time in Leicester even though they were permanent signings were spent in hotels because they didn't move their families down there you know so the family stayed up here they went down to Leicester now, under the circumstances, I think that's all it comes down to. You know, he's moving to a temporary um, place, i.e. the hotel, until such times that his family can actually join him. You know, wherever his family are based, are they down in London, are they over in Switzerland, I'm not too sure. But that certainly is a circumstance. And when I look at that, I do have a great deal of sympathy for him. And there's probably others that we don't know the circumstances of. El Hamid, it's a shame because I think for a spell, it looked uh, to me as though we, we really did have a decent player there. Frustrating with the, the amount of injuries that he's had. But when he was on form, I, I liked El Hamid. I thought he gave us um, good cover at right, right back. I thought he was comfortable on the ball going forward. But it's frustrating when you're in a situation where it's beyond the football, isn't it? And you've got a wife and kids elsewhere and you need to go back. So I would expect that uh, to be one departure that will happen before the end, of, uh, before the start of the new season. But how many other players are in, in the same situation as that? And then you ask yourself, well, if that was um, apparent, and it obviously was as early as the Ferenc Varos game, what Kevin was talking about, Russell, this split in the dressing room, would it have been an option to play? the new guys, rather than play six unhappy players. I mean, I know we've got um, in Cham, we've got Frimpong away, so there's probably another three or four unhappy guys in the dressing room. But um, you look at the performances of Ayer and the returning form of Eduard, and I've got no concerns about those two. Um, Christie, I'm not sure. I think he, his form's been kind of patchy. And uh, beyond that, I couldn't tell you who else is unhappy in that dressing room. I've heard the rumours like everybody else. Would it have been more of a um, attack to actually play the new guys because they want to embed themselves in the Celtic team? They don't have an issue with anybody in the dressing room. Any frustrations in the dressing room, first and foremost, need to be identified by the manager. Um, that's that's one of his, his responsibilities in the role that he's in. And if you're sensing unhappy players or you're maybe causing players to be unhappy being the flip side because usually the main factor in a player being unhappy in the dressing room can be whoever the management team is causing that unhappiness. That needs to be identified um, and then decisions made when you're picking your team. Of course, that has to be part of the decision-making process. I think that is important. Um, we'll always go back to it because it was such a key statement that he said. You know, when he said there's players that don't want to be here, he then played the exact same start in the next match. Uh, I mean, that was just the biggest contradiction Ever. So if he was willing to do that then in such a short period of time, you know, a four-day difference where basically he flung the players under the bus, blamed the reason on the on the terrible result and the fact that, you know, half of them don't want to be there, whatever the words he says, I'm doing that that verbative thing uh, you were talking about there, Kev. But um, basically, to do that and then pick the exact same 11, to me, is just a complete mixed signal. So for him to then do that over the course of a whole season, 
and it, of course it then becomes impossible to, de- uh, to identify which ones outside your end chams and frimpongs are the unhappy ones because you know he's obviously going to pick players regardless of, of that unhappiness which to me is it's interesting because he's either got to take responsibility for them not being happy or if they are unhappy I want them I don't know why it takes right to the end of the, the January window as well for these guys to go um, I mean I think he said about Frimpong it was six to eight weeks that he'd been unhappy or what's that effect um, in Cham it'd been two years and yet it's deadline day that they're going. Um, mm. Again, as much as we'll look at the Frimpong deal and say that was really good value, good business, he only cost 350 grand. City get, what, 30 to 40% of that? Realistically, what, we made six, seven million pounds? Are you getting the maximum value of this player in a January transfer window, mid-COVID period, and at the very end of that window as well? No. Regardless of whether it seems a lot of money on paper. Um, I know I'm going to wee bit off on a tangent here, but I just feel that Yes, those players, he's obviously were unhappy. Lennon has said various timelines for how long they've been unhappy. Can you then work out which other ones are and which other ones aren't? On the basis of what we've seen so far, it's a wee bit muddled to me, so no, I'm not entirely sure. There's a lot of good comments coming through on the Twitter channels, also on Facebook and on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to click on the subscribe button. It should be on the bottom right of your screen. If not, it'll be underneath the screen. And... Uh, catch up with daily bulletins on a, a daily basis. Uh, were you doing the wee point down finger there, was, Kevin? Was, oh, nice one. Um, so, yeah, we do put uh, even interviews with Alexei Mark Hughes out there as part of the broadcast, and we've got another few lined up, excels, uh, that I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear from. So, Kevin, before I get on to the, the comments that are coming in from our, our uh, listeners, our regular listeners, let's talk about David Turnbull. I mean, it's a shame that we've not been in the stadium to watch this boy. He's absolutely, for me, he's the shining light in that Celtic team at the moment. Definitely. What's it? Three assists in two games. Um, he's always involved in key passes. He's always involved in getting shots away. He's, he, everything that we do good, he, he, he seems to be involved in it. I, I, I do find it quite worrying that he keeps on getting taken off. Uh, now, but then we've got to put that down to, well, no, Gavin Stratton's laptop has switched, has switched, is connected to real-time analytic information, so they might be getting told that his performance level has dropped, even though it doesn't look like that to the naked eye, but what a player, I've been really, really impressed with him, um, hopefully going on, he maybe gets developed a bit more, maybe with a better coaching staff, and we can keep him for years and years to come. When we signed him, I was expecting a, a Stuart Armstrong type player, but he's far better than Armstrong. He's got far better ability than Armstrong. Uh, Armstrong was a bit more forceful and physical. He, mm-hmm. he, he, he can actually. He's got a bit of. He's got a bit of class and the uh, a light touch. Uh, has a uh, Turnbull. I'm, I'm really looking forward to actually seeing him in a stadium. I want to see him like full vision rather than just want the telly showing us. I was saying over the weekend we need to build our team around this player. Uh, Russell, what's your thoughts? Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Obviously, the wee vote last night on Twitter, which went down a storm as usual. I think people are taking me a bit too literally when I said David Turnbull, obviously. But anyway, I think absolutely. I mean, just to quickly touch on the sub, the, the, the substitution thing. My concern is it doesn't matter what the scoreline is, and it doesn't matter what the match, the, like the, the match situation is. Now, we've spoken a lot on the pod in the past about game management. Now, if we're just going purely on the analytics getting shown in Gavin Strachan's laptop, is that game management? Because every every match is completely different, obviously. Certain situations require different sort of tactics, different type of players. But it doesn't seem to me to matter whether we're in a strong lead, we're getting beat, or it's tight like it was at the weekend when it didn't need to be. Um, Turnbull seems to be the go-to man to, to, to be subbed off. So I'm, I'm not quite understanding that one. Um, I don't know if he's an easier target. You know, we always talk about Lennon having his favourites. Um, is that one of just Lennon's easier ones? He doesn't kick up as much of a fuss when I take him off after a certain amount of time. Maybe that's a wee bit looking too much into it. But it is. it does seem abnormal how all, it's always him who seems to be the go-to. And if you actually try and differentiate the, the, the score lines and the match situations, it makes no odds he comes off. But as a player on the positive side, absolutely fantastic. And I think right now you're watching him playing 
further forward than what he probably will in his late 20s. I think it's quite obvious that he's got the ability, the awareness, he plays with the head up, that he'll be able to drop, you know, deeper and deeper and play that, you know, Pirlo role without, don't please, I never said that he's, and, you know, he's as good as Pirlo before the comments go nuts, but I think he's certainly, you can hear it, <laughs> but I think he's definitely someone who's got the ability to, to, to drop deeper as his career progresses um, and lose that direct approach. And I just think he's got an eye for a pass and he's the creative force in the team right now and playing for 90 minutes, please. From McStay to Pirlo. That's huh? it, mate. That's, I know. Via Baggio. Via Stevie Baggio, yes. Uh, we've seen a lot of people being compared over the years. I will try and get to some of the comments but please if you are going to comment here's one for you ask Kevin and the, and the rest of the team over the weekend about the noise at football games because I've heard time and time again Neil Lennon talking about the influence of Celtic fans the fact that we're not there being a massive aspect of the poor performances this season and I asked the, the one and only person that I know who's been at the games and that's someone who commentates is do the sounds get piped into the stadium. Now, that sounds like a daft question, but how would I know? Because I'm not at the game. But I mm -hmm. had seen some footage of um, incidents that was isolated and all you could hear were, were the people in the stadium. So you could hear everybody shouting and there was no sound getting pumped in. So I'm thinking, is it a TV thing? So I asked the, this commentator, as I say, who commentates for a different team entirely. And he says, no, it's silent. It's silent in the stadiums and it's just the players you can hear barking and shouting and greeting and moaning and I was thinking well maybe it's just the power of TV I thought actually in the stadium they could hear the cries and the shouts would it not be better if they could if it was piped in through the tannoys I can anybody they out there the I, I know. thought they did at the start of the season I thought, I thought they had, that as well I thought they'd done it and then it was on a slight delay so the ball was hitting the back of the net and you were getting like the cheer on that as much as it was probably only a second delay it seemed like it was much longer than that because Obviously, the action's happening right in front of you, so they stopped doing it. Um, I was convinced it went through the stadium at the start of the season. I'm sure on one of the games I watched earlier on in the season, they says that they piped at, at certain intervals, they piped it into the stadium. Mm -hmm. But then they've still got the goal music. They still played I Want to Be Adored when Eddie scored and switched on the disco lights. So <laughs> why, why, why are they doing that? It's, it just doesn't make any sense. I know. But again, I just couldn't. Um, I just couldn't tell you actually uh, how daft I felt when I was putting it into a private group. So what I've done now is just thrown it out to the Axom <laughs> thousands, so everybody can ridicule me and say, oh, "Of course, it's paid through the, it's piped through." But we came up with an idea, didn't we, Kevin? Every season ticket holder gives the club your laptop and then dials in for the game, so they can turn it around and you can watch it from your seat. And obviously, you could hear us. So we can boo. So ah. we can boo. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest Zoom call. Can you get 57,000 people in one Zoom call? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't use Zoom. Um, but a very important point has been brought up by Cormac Ryan. Thanks for getting involved, Cormac. Sorry, I've been trying to get this up all um, all during the show, but uh, when these two guys get started, it's 45 minutes before you know what's happened. Big positive shout out for the Drive to Race funds for the Cano to cover costs of season tickets. Deprived of any fundraising events with COVID, but still paying full whack to the club for season tickets and I believe that it's 20 grand a year isn't it for all the season tickets at the Cano Foundation uh, purchase and that is to get young kids underprivileged kids into the game give them a whole experience of the game they get you know they get the lucky bag they get all this kind of stuff and what you're often finding is that this could be their very first game this could be their introduction to Celtic this could be people who might have gone elsewhere might not even have been a football fan and they're introducing these kids to that thing called Celtic and what they do is phenomenal. We've had Erin on the show, haven't we, Kevin, a couple of times. Erin's mm -hmm. um, a talented young lady who's also a very uh, talented poet as well. I'm sure Kevin will agree. So we'll do everything on a Celtic state of mind we possibly can to get behind the campaign. We haven't spoken to the Cano directly about this, but I'm sure we can uh, tap in with Erin. Um, because it is so important, Kevin, isn't it? The, the work that the foundation does to get young young people into the ground to support Celtic. If Dom Mackay's listening to this, if, if you want to get the Celtic support back on side, deal with this. Make sure that they can all get their season tickets for nothing going forward. That's that should mm -hmm. be one of his first one of yep. his first actions when he walks through that door. And the next thing it should be is to actually speak with the support 
and support the support the way that we've done the club this year. If he, if he wants to get off on a good foot, that's the two things he needs to tackle. Since you were on last week, Kevin, has any of the Celtic players phoned you, by the way? No, thank God. <laughs> I don't think I don't think anybody for Celtic will ever be phoning me again. So are you on? The, are you on that list? Are you on that list? I, I, I'm I'm on that list. I I'm on the band list. Eh? I'm, I'm I'm more welcome and follow follow than what I'm at up Celtic way. <laughs> Now, Jake Ryan comes in via YouTube to say, still no review on the 8th of February. Clearly, they never intended on doing a review. I just hoped we would go on a winning streak that never came. What actually happens as well, though, is, um, and obviously when we're doing the we're doing the daily bulletins and you're, you're really looking at every single uh, development at Celtic Football Club, you look into every single word in the statements. That, have we misinterpreted this? Are we yes. expecting a, an update that we were never going to be given? Yeah, JP nailed it on... Uh uh, on Thursday, I, 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 I never thought of it at all until he said he was so spot. He goes, Look at the actual word. All he says is, We'll review it in the new year. They never said they're announcing a January review. And uh, yeah, I thought the way it was put out on Thursday's broadcast, it just completely turned my head on. I thought, Maybe we are just over scrutinizing, taking everything literally that's coming from them. Um, they never did say there's going to announce a January review at the end of the the end of the month or anything like that. The, the, well, from what from what uh, JP was saying on on Thursday, I, I was quite. I, I completely changed my mind on that one. I think he was spot on. And um, the, the linguistics that Celtic used weren't maybe as defining as what we've turned them into. Mm. It, take, it takes you back though. When do you stop wishing people a happy new year? So maybe what Celtic are actually saying, we should still be wishing everybody a happy new year because it is still the new year. I thought you only got to the 5th of January or the 8th of January, son, today that then it becomes bad luck. <laughs> or, or, people, just, or people just get bored of it and get on with their, their day-to-day lives, Kevin. But aye, maybe, aye, so. again, this comes back to the communication aspect because all it would take is some form of communication to confirm that, Russell, you know, to say True. exactly what JP said. There is or there was an internal review that's been concluded and we're going to, get, we're going to continue when Neil Lennon is a manager. So, you know, even if we got that, I don't think it would uh, make anybody feel any better, but at least we've got an update. A bit of clarity, definitely. Yep. And I think that's been one of the things, I mean, obviously the communication side of things, like we're back to where we were at the start of the show, Kev saying that was his most disappointing aspect this season was not on the pitch, off the pitch. And I certainly think that is, that is a good way of putting it as well. I mean, obviously, maybe it was, it got read into too much, but once it blew up the way it did, and it's not just on this pod that has been discussed this January review, and it was referred to on every broadcast that you listen to, whether it's a, a national one or, or a fans one. Um, just nip it in the bud if, if that was the case that you weren't going to do that. It's quite simple. And, you know, all of us would kind of sit back and go, oh, actually, when you look back at what they said at the time, they just said they were going to review it. I don't think anyone would have an issue with that, but lack of communication... And then leads to this, you know, this perception of aloofness and ivory towers start getting mentioned and all that nonsense. And sometimes I think the Celtic board could have helped themselves a heck of a lot better than what they have this season when you when you reflect on it like rather now. No, I absolutely agree with that. Now, there's a lot of uh, respect and admiration coming in for David Turnbull. Uh, David Tarasidio yes. comes in to see him and Soro in midfield. I think that is the future uh, of Celtic going forward. Jungle Lion, welcome back to the show, sir. More serious question is, why did it take six months for him to get a game? I think a lot of us are scratching their heads with that one. And uh, John. He wasn't fit enough, is that? <laughs> John Aaron uh, Turnbull should be at the point of the diamond. I think that's a good point, actually. Uh, pardon the pun, because we shouldn't certainly be moving him about to accommodate others. I, I would say Turnbull is the linchpin of this side, and others have to actually fit around him, not the other way about. Barca boy comes in, welcome back to say the best positive of the season is Turnbull, which raises the question: Why did it take six months to see him? That's the frustration. You wonder about him flying at the beginning of the season, um, and then obviously managing the time of Brown around Sorrow. You know, these are the things with hindsight uh, that you wished the club had done better this season. And Gigi comes in to say Turnbull developments will go into hibernation whilst learning and co are in charge. Kevin, when you're looking at the development of players like him, and also I'm going to have to include Welsh in that because I've been, I have been impressed with Welsh. I'm not getting um, you know, carried away with him. I think that he's got a composure about him that I'm very impressed with. He doesn't panic. Yep. Uh, I, I've used the example of him kind of talking, 
you know, lacks salt through games. As I said over the weekend, there's a, an area of his game that we haven't seen yet, and that's his long range passing, which I'm looking forward to him bringing into the game. And I think that'll come with confidence. I mean, give him games, Kevin, from now to the end of the season. Let him build a partnership with someone who probably will be playing with AC Milan or someone at that level in the next few years. That's how good Ayer is. And they'll be playing for Norway uh, for the foreseeable. So let Welsh play these games. Let them develop in the first team. Let them play the games, but us as supporters will need to understand that he is going to make mistakes because of his lack of experience. I mean, he's, he's five foot 11 and he wins a, a fair percentage of balls in the air as well. So he has got something there. He keeps everything simple. He does the basics. He looks like a school prefect. Um, so I <laughs> keep him there. Keep him there for keep 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 him there for the last fourteen. Keep him there for the last fourteen, fifteen games or whatever's left of this season. And let's see if we've got a player. Let's 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 see if we have got a player there. And it's the same way. I I think he needs to actually get the games. I've got I've got no I've got no confidence. I've got every confidence that he's got, not going to get suspended today. That's going that's going to get thrown out. So oh, keep terrible. him so so keep him and uh, Eddie up front. Turnbull Sorrow keep them in the team as well. I do think we've got to look at the goalkeeper situation, and um, the three goalkeepers that we've used this season you would struggle to actually get a decent goalkeeper out of the three of them, what we've actually seen. But I think that's a lot to do with confidence. Mm -hmm. And a decision's got to be made. I thought Bain got a bit of unfair criticism on, on Saturday. The ball took a deflection. But he hasn't. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't inspire confidence. And I think we've got to have a look at bringing back in Barkas. I mean, we've wa we watched Barkas for four years. We scouted him for four years. So surely that goalkeeper that was scouted for four years is still there. How big a part, Kevin, has been that transition? We spoke about it with Ayeti. How, how many of those uh, elements are playing into the performances that we see from Barkas? It could be. It could well be that he's maybe in rented accommodation himself. I don't know his personal circumstances. But then he was playing in front of a, a centre-half in, in Duffy who... The manager has now admitted has been really struggling off the pitch. Mm. So that's not going to help him. The fact is we don't look well coached when it comes to set play. Set plays doesn't help him either. I mean, you, you look at us when, when a ball goes in the box. It's like a grenade getting thrown into a, into a room. We don't know what to do. And it's desperation stages. And that, and that doesn't help the goalkeeper. It doesn't. Now, there's a point coming through, so I'm going to throw this one to you. And this isn't me being negative, by the way, but uh, it's coming in from Facebook. Turnbull is a massive upgrade on Armstrong. I agree with that from what I've seen. Uh, I was a big fan of Armstrong, but we know where he went because as soon as you get that player with that kind of ability, uh, the vultures start circling Celtic Park. This is a guy who is the most promising Scottish footballer at the moment. And what happens to the most promising Scottish footballers is that they invariably get a lot of attention from down south. Now, this yeah. is something we really need to protect this this guy. I mean, we're in a situation at the moment where I don't think anyone is going to expect Ryan Christie to be at Celtic next season. Now, yeah. a lot of people are going to look at his performances this season and um, they won't be too concerned. I know Colin Watt's not a massive fan, but there's a talent in that player, Ryan Christie, and we need to make sure that David Turnbull isn't going to get to the situation where, you know, if we don't improve what he's on at this moment in time, then the big first offer, the big offer that comes in from an English club and he's away. I mean, I want to see him developing at Celtic. That's a big fear for me, Russell. Yeah, well, I think there's two sides. There's, there's a business side as well. There's a reason why you're absolutely right. When you get these hot talents or young talents that are coming through, you're always susceptible to, to losing them down south. Um or to another European league with more, more riches, such as the case with Frimpel. However, I want to see us getting maximum value if that is going to be the case and their head is turned and they do want to go elsewhere. The only way you get maximum value is if they're coached right, developed right, and playing in a successful team competing at the highest level that team possibly can. Celtic, too often for me, don't make the Champions League group stages. Imagine if you had these guys, I mean, you're looking at the Frimpel value, the 11 million, sorry to go back to that, but I just think, had he had a Champions League season under his belt this year, even if we'd went out, but we'd maybe got two wins at the six games, something like that at home, 
some really stellar displays away from home with him being one of the one of the main key components of that. What is what does that do to your value these days? I think it multiplies it massively. Um, and I want to make sure that if we've got a gem like David Turnbull for however long they're here, let's make sure he's part of a co- he's working under a coaching setup that are going to nurture him and develop in the best possible way. Let's m- make sure that when he's playing in matches, he's taken off at the right times and not just because he's an e- easy target to be taken off. And let's make sure that the level he's playing at is the highest level Celtic can, which, as I say, I think is Champions League level. Um, and therefore, when the when the inevitable does happen and his agent says in his ear, look, there's this, that, and the next thing looking at you down south, it's time to tell him that you want to go. We get the most value possible so we can then reinvest that in the next David Turnbull, you know what I mean, going forward. Absolutely. Now, uh, Jim Hannaway comes in. Background sound is from TV, so we don't hear the players swearing. Tony Hutton, uh, welcome back, Tony. I hope you're well. No, they I don't. I want to hear them swearing. Uh, as they don't give you an option sound. Or, or, uh, they give you an option sound or no sound. So there you go. It's not piped in. Would that have helped? Would that have helped anything with regards to uh, adding a little bit of element of fan participation? I don't know. It's all too little, too late now. Uh, in any case, Monty is uh, quite rightly asking, Super, fo- Super Bowl? Um, is that what Kevin was checking on his phone? I don't know. Someone also <laughs> comes in to say Gavin Strachan is the peer law of data analytics. The peer law of data analytics? Really? Is he that good at it? So there's always uh, plenty to discuss when it comes to the world of Celtic. I'll leave you with one final thing to consider, and that is we've got Wednesday, Sunday, St Mirren, St Johnston, both away. St Mirren have also already shown us what they can do to us. St Johnston might get the new manager bounce in Tommy Wright. That's two tough games for Celtic. Uh, no, Tommy Wright's went to Kilmarnock. Eh? Oh, that's right, aye. I'm thinking aye, St Johnston. <laughs> Kevin, I, you know what? I'm thinking of the last time you and I were at an away game together. That was St Johnston, aye. Won nothing with Ryan yep. Christie. Yep. Um, two tough games, two really tough games. I was making sure you were paying attention because when Russell was talking, you were on your phone. <laughs> when I was on my phone checking because somebody in the comment that somebody in the comment says that Stephen Welsh was hundred and ninety centimetres. And I've just went on and checked that that I usually checked and it does say he's hundred and eighty. So that's five foot eleven for me. So maybe we need to get uh, Stephen Welsh's maw on to tell us what height he actually is. But well, it does it does look like a school prefect, you were right in saying that. <laughs> it's a tough game. I mean St Mun already turned us over at home a couple of weeks ago. And Jim Duff, uh, Jim Duffy, Jesus, Jim Goodwin uh, knows, set his team up extremely well against us. Mm-hmm. So it's a tough, tough game for us uh, at the New Love Street or the the People's Republic of Paisley Stadium or whatever it's called. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not actually sure what it's called. Was it not called the City Culture Stadium or something like that? See, uh, on that point, can I dive in there for a second, Kevin? Um I, it's just like calling, you know, Livingston Almondville. Does it really matter if you sell the naming rights to a stadium? Does it really matter? I know that a lot of Celtic fans are very, very, you know, precious about that. Mm-hmm. But does it matter? You'd still call it Celtic Park, wouldn't you? You yeah. would. You would. And it's just to get printed on a ticket, ain't it, really? And for it to be on the, the score apps and, and, and stuff like that. I'm, I've, I've really been surprised that Emirates have never took up to like name the stadium where the Emirates Arena just across right the across. road. I, I'm really, really surprised that's never been on the table. Maybe it has been on the table and it's been rejected. But I've got no, I've got no bother with it. I'm just thinking of the, the Scottish Rugby Union situation. Um, is it the BT Murrayfield? And you know, it's one of these things. I've seen Celtic fans say no chance. You know, that's sacrilege. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I don't think it, it's that important. I mean, Kevin, you've just. You, you questioned what Love Street's called. It's not even the same stadium. Never mind what it, you know. You still call it Love Street. You still call Livingston Almondville. I know I do anyway. Um, so I don't. I don't see the, the massive importance in it personally. Oh. It's it is what it is. I mean, how many names has Celtic Park got? Celtic Park, Parkhead. If you're for the West End of Glasgow, Parkers. Uh, so I, I, I mean, everybody calls it Paradise. The Holy Ground. Mm-hmm. There's loads of names for Celtic Park. Eh? So, I think that's the first time anyone said Parker's on this uh, podcast. And because of that, I'm just going to terminate it. This is the end. <laughs> this is the end. Okay, as Jim Morrison said. Right. Uh, all that's left for me to say thank you, everybody, for getting involved on Twitter, Facebook, and on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, get subscribing on there. We've got some brilliant interviews coming up on a Celtic state of mind with the Excels. And all that's left for me to say, 
uh, to the Monday Club, Russell Boyce and Kevin Graham. Thank you once again for joining me on a 